So good good evening, everyone. We are very lucky to have with us Dr. Karthik Raj Mani. Karthik Raj Mani is a very good friend of mine, and I personally was very much benefited by his physics lectures while during my residency. Uh, at that time, he was a senior physicist in SGPGI Lucknow, and Am I audible now? Yeah, you're audible. Yeah, and uh, then he moved to United Hospital, Dhaka, and currently he is working there as consultant and chief medical physicist in Department of Radiation Oncology. He has helped them to set up a new state-of-the-art department in Dhaka, and probably that was the first uh, modern radiation unit that he had established there. So um, I feel I personally enjoyed his classes during my residency and it was really beneficial for me and we are lucky to have him here after more than a decade we could contact him and uh, I feel we can get benefited uh, by his classes again and he has uh, accepted our request to take few classes in our physics course and this is one of the most important chapter for the students for uh, in exam point of view. So I welcome Dr. Karthik Rajmani, uh, consultant and chief medical physicist, United Hospital, Dhaka, Bangladesh. And he will be teaching us today measurement of ionizing radiation. And um, uh, Dr. Karthik, now you can start. Yeah, thanks Dr. Shan Paul. And uh, it was really an um, honor to be a part of the, you know, uh, this uh, very good initiative of uh, taking a physics class for uh, mainly for the MD radiation oncology students. Uh, today, my topic is going to be on uh, measurement of ionizing radiation. Uh, as a radiation oncologist, I can understand it will be a little bit of an, you know, uh, not uh, like, you know, like, you know, as interested, like, you know, as like a treatment planning and other things, but it's a very essential element of, uh, to understand what is about, you know, how we measure an ionizing radiation. Uh, to start with, you know, like uh, like the X-ray was uh, start like you know we Willem Ronjan as you know discovered in 1905, but within few years the X-ray started being like you know started we started using clinically, and 1906 like you know like uh, we started using for an X-ray imaging and within few years of the invention of X-rays we started using it for uh, uh, for radiotherapy purpose mainly for you know superficial and ortho voltage radiotherapy we have started in uh, late 90s 1910 or something so that you know uh, but that time we don't have any kind of a tool for measuring the ionizing radiation or like measuring the x-rays so that in the early days uh, for the use like you know we use x-rays for the treatment but uh, the measurements that they try to do uh, for an example you know the radiation effect on um, radiographic emulsion like you know like flame flames and uh, changes in the colors of some chemical component, like, you know, nowadays we use like a gel dosimetry, there's a change in the color density. So that, and uh, the other important factors that time they used is the reddening of the skin, um, which is like, you know, we call skin erythma. Okay, that was an, uh, like, you know, um, a, like a factor which they used as a measuring device when you start treating X-rays. So that skin erythma dose uh, was defined as an amount of X-ray or radiation just produces as a rating of the human skin. So it can be in several gray, okay, so that it can be on a few gray. It depends upon kind of radiation, what we use. And um, like the type of the skin, like, you know, the, the skin erythema is not a very, uh, it's a very crude way of measuring ionizing dose. Like um, uh, the problem is the skin erythema depends on many conditions, especially the type of skin, you know, some patients will have, uh, Within like you know four gray or five gray, you'll have a higher skin erythema, whereas some patient will have that can go up to ten gray, or some patient will have for two gray. So that you know, we, we, it is not a very you know import, like you know uh, confident um, like you know measurement tool to measure the dose, and it varies with the quality of radiation, like um, whether it is an you know uh, if we are using a hundred kV an X-ray, or if you are using an ortho voltage, you can go up to five hundred kV. X-ray, so that you know, we it, it it changes totally vary with the quality of the radiation what we give, and amount of the skin exposed also the skin erythema like you know varies. So if if you are treating a very small area or if you are treating a larger area, that also varies, and the dose per fraction on every intervals, that will also like you know as you understand like you know it will also give a different skin erythema 
like you know the doses so that it's very complicated and it's uh, like you know with skin erythema dose we cannot really measure the uh, ionizing radiation so that it was very complicated that time because the x rays been introduced and really we don't have uh, any tool to measure the radiation so that it was a very difficult condition but at that time there is no option so that the skin erythema has been used as an you know tool to measure the radiation but the skin erythema was used in an auto voltage time you know it was used in auto voltage era and it the mainly because the problem is when you have a skin erythema you cannot treat the patient so that you know skin erythema was a limiting organ uh, uh, for more to deliver the tumoral dose so that you know this is a very important factor and the other thing we need to understand is it's a very crude way of measuring the um, measuring the doses so that you know it's not at all a good factor or a good component to measure the measure the radiation dose so that uh, once you know like the uh, linear oscillators and mega voltage radiation machines like you know they started in 1920s and 30s then uh, they gradually they reduce uh, doing this auto voltage therapy because once you have an ma mission obviously you can go with that okay so that in 1928 this international commission of radiological units uh, and measurements they defined a unit called ronjan for measuring an x-ray and gamma rays so that we need to be very clear the unit of exposure is ronjan and it can be used only for x-rays and gamma rays and it can be measured in a medium of air not in any other medium so that we need to be very clear exposure has to be mentioned in air and it has to be measured only for x-rays and gamma rays okay so that normally the unit is denoted by r and um, like uh, if if you know the you know quantity of exposure in r it can be converted into other factors to observe those using an you know conversion factors so that uh, ronjan originally defined as one ronjan is equal to one electrostatic units so cubic cubic meter or cubic centimeter at standard temperature and pressure that time the standard temperature pressure was 0 degree celsius and 760 mg of mercury but later they found you know uh, instead of defining a ronjan in per cubic centimeter if we can define this volume in a coulomb per kilogram okay so that what they did is we know exactly like you know the amount of one esu which produces 3.33 into 10 power minus 10 coulomb of charges for an one cubic centimeter so that if you amount if you weigh an amount of an uh, for one cent cubic centimeter of an air which has a weight of 1.293 into 10 power minus 6 kilogram if you divide these two factors this uh, you will get one ronjan is equal to 2.58 into 10 power minus 4 coulomb per kilogram so that they redefine this uh, ronjan definition from one esu to like uh, in uh, coulomb per centimeter cube to coulomb per kilogram okay so that uh, the basic definition of ro- the quantity of an exposure is measured in ionization produced with by air by photons normally see like when you ask for a definition the definition could not be changed so that we need to be always uh, we have to stick to the definitions when you when you get it to the exams better to go with the definitions there is no like you know you cannot just change the definition so that you know as per the definitions when you ask for a questions you know try to be with the definitions so that icr defines it's as an exposure as a quotient of uh, dq that is an amount of a charge produced in a mass by dm where dq is an absolute value of a total charge of an ion on one sign produced by air it can be an electron or an positron whatever it is so that it has to be one sign which has to be everything has to be collected that is the important concept like you know we cannot leave any ion which is produced in the particular mass we have to collect all the ions we will go through like you know in the further uh, slides why it is very important and how we can you know do that uh, like in the ionization chambers so that we can clearly define it's an amount of a charge collected in a particular amount of a mass uh, the ionization we have to so that it has been defined as uh, exposure is defined by dq by dm that's the quotient of charge by the amount of mass and one ronjan is 2.58 into 10 power minus 4 coulomb per kilogram in air okay before getting into uh, the chambers and you know how it works the principle of the chambers we need to clearly understand the interaction of photons with uh, like you know matter and uh, especially probably this class has been shifted due to the some you know um, un, like an avoidable reasons so the just i will try to go with some photon interactions with the air or some molecules like you know how it interacts the coherence scattering is something you know uh, which is <clears throat> not a very important concept in radiotherapy or in radiology but it's it 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 really it it been a part of an interaction of radiation with matters when a photon comes which which has a, normally the coherence scatters happens with a very low energy something about 
less than 5 kV or 3 kV where it doesn't have an energy to knock out the electrons of the outer shell. Normally, the coherent scattering effect on the outer shell electrons. If you have an energy of an, uh, if, if it incidence on a particular electron on, on, on an outer orbital electron or an valence cell electron, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't change or it doesn't eject any electron from the atom. But what it does is like, you know, it just take the energy, like the energy level of the electron further high and it just change the direction of the photon slightly with the same energy so that there is no energy loss in the coherent scattering. So that it's just a change of the direction of the incident photon and there is no ionization happens with the coherent scattering. When you go to the photoelectric effect, the, the photon comes and normally the photoelectric effect happens in the inner shell bound electrons, okay? So that the, whenever the photon comes, the, you can see that the inner shell electron has been ejected out, okay? So that, and with, during this process, the entire photon energy has been deposited to the electron, okay? So that the entire energy of the incident photon minus the binding energy, the remaining energy will be the ejected electron, photoelectron energy. So that in the photoelectric effect, the only thing you need to understand is it is a complete absorption of the photons energy. There is There will be no photon or no scatter will be there. It's a complete absorption of the photon. So that when you, when you try to correlate with the imaging purpose, why photoelectric is very important is because it doesn't have any scatter photons. It really gives a very good image quality. Like whether you take in a film or if you take in an, any imaging panel, you'll get a very good image quality because there is no scatter photons. Because the entire photon has been completely absorbed by the, like if you're passing through the body, by the bones and by the soft tissue, it passed through so that you get a very good image quality because of the photoelectric effect. And the photoelectric effect, normally it ranges from like somewhere around up to 100 kV, the photoelectric dominates. Once the energy increases, like, you know, the photoelectric effect normally decreases and the photoelectric effect is also an important component and it's directly proportional to the atomic number. So that it's a cube of, you know, it's a directly proportional to the cube of the atomic number. So that as the amount of an electron per unit gram increases, the photoelectric effect increases. And other thing is when the energy increases, the photoelectric effect decreases. The other uh, interaction with the photon is Compton, Compton, Compton effect. And it is very important is because all the radiotherapy energy range, what we took, talk about cobalt <coughs> or a linear oscillators, most of our interactions, more than 90% of the interactions are happen with the Compton effect. Okay, so that if the Compton effect, what is happening is the interaction is mainly between the photon and the outer shell electrons or the valence shell electrons. And the, the byproduct of this Compton effects are, you'll have the, uh, the, the valence cell electron will be ejected, which is called the Compton electron, as well as you will have a scattered photon. So that you have two products in the Compton effect, whereas in photoelectric effect, you have only uh, just the exited electron, photoelectron will be there with the energy minus the incident electron minus the binding energy. So that Compton effect is the predominant effect, which is in the radiotherapy range. And it has uh, the ejected electron as well as the scattered photon. So that when you try to see an image, like, you know, if you try to correlate with the imaging principle in radiotherapy, like if you're taking a portal imaging with an MV image, MV imager, obviously your image quality is not good as KV image because of the scattered photons, okay? So that now we can understand why the KV image is having a very good quality compared to an, uh, like, you know, high energy photon. When we try to take an image with an something about six MV or an uh, six MV photon, we don't have a very good image because of the scattered Compton effect. Compton uh, photons. Again, the other uh, interaction mainly take place is uh, uh, pair production, which is uh, which is uh, like you know uh, a typical example of how an energy has been converted to a mass. Okay, so that if an any photon energy which has an energy of 1.02 MeV, which is directly interact with the nucleus, it can be converted into two particles, okay, electron and a positron with an energy of 0 0.51 TV. And if the energy is of the incident photon is more, then the energy will be equally divided between this electron and the positron. So that these are the most, mostly four main interaction which happens when the photon is interacting with an air molecule or if it's within inside the body. And the Compton effect predominates in the radiotherapy range. 
Okay. Before getting into the uh, measurement of ionizing radiation, we need to be very care. Like you know, we need have to have a clear understanding of electronic equilibrium. Electronic equilibrium is uh, is something like you know, if you assume okay, this is uh, the collecting electrode, and we applied a voltage to collect. Okay. So that this is our active area. If just to assume okay, it's a small cavity of a chamber, and whenever a photon is passing, obviously you have an electron the ionization is produced all over whenever the excess is passing through. so that but within the range of our like you know the active volume there may be few electrons entering from the you know active volume and few electrons which are going out okay when we tell we, it is a, attain the chamber or in a particular point as attain an electronic equilibrium is the number of electrons entering the particular particular volume and the number of electrons going out of the particular volume is same if that is the Uh, that is the like you know uh, time we used to tell okay this uh, this chamber has an electronic equilibrium or this cavity has an electronic equilibrium so that all these measurements of this ion chamber has to be conducted in electronic equilibrium that is very important so that uh, like you know the electron which is produced outside the you know volume which can also contribute but the same times which is uh, which is also produced the ionization produced inside the volume which can go about so that if 100 electron which is produced outside the like you know our active volume of the chamber which is entering into the active volume the same 100 electron has to go out of this active volume then we this condition we used to tell as electronic equilibrium so that this ionization loss has been compensated by a gain as well as loss some ionization has been entered and some has been lost okay so that this condition if if both matches we tell this as an electronic equilibrium and this, this Under this uh, circumstances, we can define the region. Okay, otherwise it will be very difficult. We will have an inaccuracy in the measurement. As for the definition, we have to, like you know, measure all the ionization happen in between the volume, so that it's very important the electronic equilibrium is obtained. Otherwise, the measurement is not going to be accurate. So that to measure the region, it has to be very important. We need to, we need to. Uh, so that we need to be uh, uh, we need to uh, have this uh, electronic equilibrium obtained to define this region effectively and satisfy so that the uh, first uh, like you know the chamber what we are going to talk about here is the free air ionization chamber this is not uh, like you know normally we have in our clinic normally this is in the primary standard labs okay this is a uh, uh, equipment what the used for um, uh, we used to call as a free air ionization chamber this represent the diagram represents the free air ionization chamber the extreme beams uh, like you know originating uh, the originating from the source like you know you can tell the point as yes and uh, the uh, which is also the focal spot and the d is nothing but the diaphragm which you know collimates this electron beam okay and you have uh, the c is the collecting volume and this is uh, this is the collecting electrode you can see this and there will be an uh, potential applied between these two collecting volume and normally the potential field strength between uh, these two electrodes the collecting electrode is somewhere around 100 volt per centimeter it's a high field strength so that you know none of the ionization which is produced will be go will be missed out or which can recombine we'll talk about the recombination a little bit later and all this uh, entire box has been lead lined and we have a guard electrodes here on this both the edges which will avoid the ionization like you know the ions which is produced outside this effective area to get into this effective volume and l is the uh, length of the collecting volume so that in this circumstance we define at this particular point p the exposure is defined as the amount of a charge that delta q is the charge collected in coulombs which is normally the collecting electrode is connected to the electrometer and rho is the density of the air which is inside the free air ionization chamber and ap is the cross sectional area in the meter square and l is the total length of the collecting volume so that with this um, like you know equation we can find the exposure at the particular point with the free air ionization chamber okay normally this is an you know typical like how the free air ionization chamber looks just you know we in the previous slide we just we try to see the cross sectional view of that this how uh, really it looks like you know you can see this electrodes and uh, the guarding electrode as well as uh, the collecting electrode here The, okay the accuracy of the free air need uh, some corrections uh, like you know the corrections are mainly or air retinations the recombination of the ions that uh, probably will come to in the uh, like you know subsequent slides 
and the corrections of the effect of temperature and pressure is a very important factors whenever you do any kind of a measurements of a radiation we need to correct for temperature and pressure and the humidity of a density humidity of the air is very also very important we need to keep it in particular humidity and the correction for ionization produced by the scattered photons also important so that these are the corrections required to accurately measure the exposure using the free air ionization chamber but the main drawback of this free air ionization chamber is as the photon energy increases the range of the electron liberated in the air increases rapidly so that you know the elect the mandate of an increase the separation of the collector to maintain the electronic equilibrium is very important so that if you, if you see uh, something about if i use a 3 mev photon x rays okay i need to keep a uh, electron track up to 1.5 meter long that is so big and the thickness of the air will alternate just only 5.4 percentage and four large corrections are required there so that this the main drawback of the free air ionization chamber is like you know we cannot measure uh, like the exposure more than 3 mev because it requires a very big uh, volume of an you know electrode plates and it uh, like it's somewhere around 1.35 meters so that with this free air ion chamber the maximum energy of an x ray we can measure is up to 3 mev and the other important uh, thing is when you try to increase the energy the large electrode separation creates the non uniform electric field in between the collected ele the collecting electrodes so that if you try to increase the separation between the electrodes of the collecting electrodes the normally we used to tell like you know as per the definition we are able to produce an 100 volt uniform uh, 100 volt per centimeter uniform you know voltage across these two electrode will be based on so that if you if you are not able to create a you know, uniform electric field we may lose <coughs> the amount of an ions collected inside the active volume so that for this reason uh, like you know uh, free air ionization chamber cannot be used uh, for more than 3 mev so that but it's a very accurate measurement for you know up to 3 mev we can measure the exposure okay getting into uh, as i told you like you know the free air ionization chamber is mainly for the primary standards and we normally it, it, it normally we don't use it on a clinical and you know, routines we we have a different kind of a chambers like what we use in uh, clinical routines but these chambers are calibrated against this free air ionization chamber with an you know calibration factor so that if you see the uh, different volumes of the chamber here like you know 0.1 cc 0.13 cc and this is a formative chamber and a parallel pit chamber we'll we'll just go through you know how this uh, other chambers work and obviously we need an electrometer <coughs> which is connected to these this chambers so that you know we can get an uh, amount of an ionization produced in this particular chamber volume so that we can measure and we can get it displayed by using this electrometer the one important thing we need to understand is why we require a different volumes of ionization chambers in our clinical use normally when you see about a very homogeneous beam okay like if you are treating a 10 by 10 field as uh, like we are measuring a dose at a 6 by 6 like you know 10 by 10 field normally we use for a calibration purpose we always use a 10 by 10 field normally a large volume chambers like 0.65 cc format type chamber is really good because there is not much gradient there but when you try to do and something like an where there is a high dose gradient like we are doing an iomatic qa where there is a very sharp dose gradient so that that where where we have to use very a uh, small chamber like we used to call a pinpoint chamber which has a volume of 0.1 cc so that the larger volume chambers are very you can do it very accurately but it has to be done for a very homogeneous beam where there is not much of a gradient whereas the small volume chambers where if you have a too much of a gradient the spin point chambers are really helpful to where there is a gradient we can measure this using the small volume chambers and parallel plate chambers are obviously like you know it's a very important thing like normally we use for to measure the surface doses as well as it, it can measure for electron beams we will just you know talk about these things in the subsequent slides okay we'll start with the thimble chamber the, the name uh, thimble chamber is you know came because it has an you know the cap is uh, like we used to call the uh, cap which is surrounded by a cup like a cap which is called thimble so that the, the name came from uh, like thimble uh, so that you know thimble means it's an uh, it's a cap with an uh, rounded end so that that's why we used to call a thimble chamber always we talk about the electronic equilibrium electronic equilibrium has to be exist for any chambers uh, to measure it accurately so that we need an electronic equilibrium for any chamber to be measured and the volume of the inside the chamber cavity is very important so that we have a large volume chambers and a small volume chambers so that we can know exactly how much charges produced per unit mass so that so that we know exactly you know how much of ionization is happening in how much of 
mass of an air is may be so that you know we can calculate the exposure the simple chapter wall is air equivalent i will i will talk about what is mean by air equivalent in subsequent slides we talk about the effective atomic number there and the wall thickness must be equal to or greater to or greater than the maximum range of the electron liberated in the simple chamber so that we can obtain the electronic equilibrium the density of the solid air equivalent wall or should be greater than the free air so that you know we can have a number of ionization produced on the wall which can produce an electronic equilibrium this simple chamber when you try to use in the range of 100 to 250 kvp the 1 mm of a wall thickness is good enough or a cap is good enough but when you try to use it in a cobalt beam which has an approximate energy of 1.25 mb it required a minimum cap of 5 mm to produce when we try to use it in an air obviously you require a 5 mm of a cap to produce a sufficient ionization there inside the air to make it electronic equilibrium to you know measure the exposure before getting into the effective atomic number we need to have a clear understanding about what is atomic number and what is mass number okay just if you take an um, like you know element carbon like we have an atomic number of 6 and we have a mass number of 12 so that what it means like the atomic number or otherwise called atomic weight which defines the total number of protons and total number of neutrons in any element the number of protons and number of electrons are always equal so that in this case the carbon the num the atomic number describes the number of protons which is 6 and number of electrons is 6 and the number of neutrons like 12 minus 6 is also 6 so that in carbon uh, like you know we have so that this atomic number and mass number defines the number of subatomic particles in this particular element for an example if you take a copper which has a mass number of something about 64 and an atomic number of 29 we have 29 protons and 35 neutrons and 29 electrons all these all the elements we have this protons and electrons are equal uh okay so that if we go why we need to know the effective atomic number i will just come after this slide i will explain you normally the air consists of you know three uh, like you know molecules like you know one is nitrogen oxygen and organ the nitrogen has 75.5% and oxygen has 23.2% and organ is around 1.3% so that it is convenient rather than telling a mixture of all these three molecules i can tell all, what is an equivalent effective atomic number which defines the density of this air so that the main effect the photoelectric effect is highly dependent on az the effective atomic number is only considered for photoelectric effect interaction by the photons in the range of 30 kv to 80 kv so that for to determine the effective atomic number this a1 a2 a3 or the fraction of contribution of each elements and this z is the you know the uh, atomic number of a particular element like nitrogen oxygen or and organ just i will tell you an example how you calculate and you know Uh, like effective atomic number so that we know this uh, nitrogen is 75.5% in the air and uh, 23 oxygen is 23.2 and organ is 1.3 so the number of electrons per gram of an air which is given by avogadro number that is na which is given by 6.02 into 10 power 23 that that's the number of you know subatomic particles per mole is it is your uh, aw is your atomic weight and is it is your atomic number so that to find the number of electrons per gram like for nitrogen i have 2.27 into 10 power 23 electrons per gram and oxygen is uh, around 0.7 into 10 power 23 uh, like electrons per gram and organ is 0.04 to 10 power 23 so with this equation we know like for every uh, electron uh, in the air you know the electrons per gram is something about 3.01 that we know so that if we find individually like for nitrogen if you divide by 2.27 which is we calculated here which is 0.751.23 and we apply this on the equation the effective atomic number of an air is somewhere around 7.67 okay but this is the maynard works okay maynard did this work and he found this uh, uh, this power is something about if you go and see this equation this 2.94 which is the maynard work but johnson cunningham and a lot of other authors are been worked on this and they found which is somewhere between 3.4 to 3.8 which gives a very accurate value but st but still the uh, difference is only in the last three digits so that they here what we found is the effective atomic number of the air is somewhere around 7.67 okay but so that if you want to find an air equivalent material for your chamber like graphite which has an effective atomic number is somewhere around 6 6.5 and like bakelite is another element which can be used 
or perspex like you know which can be used which the effective atomic number is somewhere around like 6 to 7 so that the like you know we need to find this um, effective atomic number to make sure like you know we can make this wall of the chambers which is ar equivalent so that we don't need to give too much of a correction for the wall correction of this chamber okay getting into the former chamber this is a more most trusted you know uh, like um, ionization chamber like the former in 1955 designed this chamber and provide an stable and reliable secondary standard you know for x rays and gamma rays for all the energy interpreting range so the former chambers normally we use this chamber for the calibration of obsolete dose in our clinac or cobalt whatever the mission like you know we use this as a your standard measure and the original design of the former chamber has been little bit modified by ard and former later because the original design has some kind of an you know issues within response uh like you know it has a difference of the energy response so that he changed a little bit of a design and the simple wall is made of a pure graphite and the central electrode as i told why this the wall has been made by graphite because it is equivalent to the uh, effective atomic number of the air so that that's what most of the like you know the wall of the uh, chambers are made by graphite and the insulator consists of this uh, former chamber is by uh, polytrichlorofluorine ethene okay that is the insulator we used like you know you can see in this diagram so that in this former chamber like uh, you have a central electrode which is made up of an aluminum and you have an outer electrode which is made up of an graphite and there is a third electrode which is called a god electrode uh, which like help us to you know uh, produce the recombination effect to avoid the recombination effect so that the collective volume of this former chamber is around 0.6 cc and um, this chamber has been you know normally used to calibrate it with the primary standard lab and they used to give an calibration factor so that when you multiply with the calibration factor with the meter reading we can get the exposure rate or you can if you get an calibration factor along the observed dose we can get it in observed dose <clears throat> whenever we use a chamber you know always we have to think about a stem leakage what is a stem leakage is like obviously like when you know, when we try to irritate a chamber obviously some component of your chamber which is have some metal component or the cables of this chambers can come inside the radiation field so that a stem leakage is defined as any extramural current or ionization produced anywhere outside the chamber sensitive volume but it contribute to the uh, collection of the ionization in the active volume which is called the stem leakage so that this will reduce your accuracy of your measurement so that like you know the stem leakage purely depends upon your chamber design so like normally if you talk about a former chamber normally it's uh, like you know really very less because it has been designed like that and uh, it depends upon the beam quality higher the beam quality you know you'll get a low, more scatter from outside the um, like active volume so that you know it can contribute so that you'll have a more stem leakage and the irradiation condition so that sometimes you want to do a triangle field and you know most of your chamber is inside the radiation field like you know they the uh, scattered photons or scatter ionization which is contribute to the active volume which is going to create a problem in your accuracy of your ionization collection so that you know this is a method you know how you measure the stem leakage you know we can put in a different points and you can put the chamber in a different way and give a same amount of a monitor or in a cobalt just you give a same amount of a dose and try to measure at a different points and obviously it is a, like you know with a different orientation of the chamber you will able to get the same amount of like here in the like if you see the uh, look, like you know the chamber in the orientation 1 and 2 the the one is going to come inside the stem is going to come more whereas in the like you know if you see the orientation of the two the stem is always out of their radiation field so that when you when you get into this too much of a stem like you know how much of the change in the radiation like an amount of a dose can be really measured and we can understand how much is the stem leakage for the all the chambers <clears throat> and this is um, like you know how the energy response of a chamber like varies when you change the quality of the beam so that normally the best way of defining an energy is the using the hdl half value layer like uh, we talk about 100 kv x rays like you know 100 kv x rays from an uh, ga x ray tube and a 100 kv x ray from an alvarin uh, x ray tube will be totally uh, different okay there so that if you tell an hvl okay i have a two uh, like mm of copper hvl for a particular beam it is more specific than we talk about the energy so that they like you know they try to you know find the calibration factor different energies of an you know photon 
and for uh, like you know they find the calibration factors so the variation like if you can see there are, there are from, except you know 0.3 mm of an um, hpl like more or less we have a unity like once you go less than that you know the energy the hpl energy which is something about 0.1 and 0.2 the calibration factor varies more than 4% otherwise if it have an hpl more than 0.3 we have a more or less you know the energy response is not much vary for this chambers former chambers like it's relatively less, less than children, less than 2 yeah. to 3% maybe some the laptop school there is an extra okay the next thing we we are going to the extrapolation chamber this the extrapolation chambers are you know especially used to measure the, the surface dose and um, the beam enters through the incident window window and which is carbon coated and which is also connected to the guard ring and there is an another electrode which is connected lower down so that the extrapolation chamber the advantage is we can increase the separation between these two electrodes so that by measuring the ionization per unit volume as a function of electrode spacing so that you know i can change the electrode spacing according to the energy and by extrapolating to the ionization curve to the zero electrode i can find <coughs> uh, i can find the measurements in the surface so that using this extrapolation chambers uh, is mainly for the special dosimetry purpose mainly used for superficial layers or you know if you want to try to do and dosimetry on electron beam or a beta like you know for, as beta particles we always use this kind of an extrapolation chambers to find the superficial dose parallel plate chambers are normally used for electron beams and parallel plate chambers the only difference between an extrapolation chamber and a parallel plate is uh, they are very similar except the parallel plate chambers the electrodes the the upper electrode and the lower electrode the distance is fixed whereas in extrapolation chambers we can change the separation between these two electrodes and we can try to measure and try to extrapolate the values whereas in parallel plate chambers these two the uh, these two electrodes the separation between the electrodes are fixed normally it will somewhere around 2 mm between these two electrodes a thin window of a foil which is somewhere around 0.1 0.01 to 03 mm which is a mylar foil of a, like you can see the surface of this chamber which is made by this mylar foil and you have an upper electrode here and these two are the guard rings which you know as we described in the prior ionization chamber here also this guard rings help us to you know collect all the ions collected in the active volume and try to you know get the extramural current or extramural ionization which is produced outside this active volume which will be guarded by this guard rings <clears throat> and the cavity perturbation is especially important in dosimetry like when you try to use a cylindrical chamber in the surface dose it is not very accurate but when you try to use this parallel plate chamber which there is the mylar foil which is on the surface which is really helpful to produce uh, this normal cylindrical chambers produce a significant perturbation whereas this parallel plate chambers really produce uh, no perturbation so that we can really measure the surface dose very accurately the most common parallel plate chambers in the markets are ma like you know we use the markers and roofs are the very common and nacp or these are the common parallel plate chambers which is available in the market and these chambers are really perfect for the dose measurements like for the depth dose measurements because surface measurements with this uh, cylindrical chambers are not very accurate because of the electronic equilibrium is not obtained in the surface when you try to go and measure the water so this is electron <coughs> and the parallel plate chambers are really helpful to measure very in a very dose gradient region <coughs> like an electron or to measure the surface dose for the photons so that if you think about a desirable uh, what are the desirable chamber characteristics there should be a minimum variation in the sensitivity of the exposure for a wide range of photo energy okay whether i use an 6 mev or a 10 mev the calibration factor should not vary too much so that you know that these are the desirable characteristics these are you know important characteristics of the chambers and it should be suitable volume to allow the measure like you know measurements to extend the range of exposure okay like you know i can like you know something about i can do it for something about 4 gray or 5 gray for an extended range of measurement it should be able to obtain the volume and there is a minimum variation of sensitivity of a direction okay just i put a chamber and i did a measurement i rotate my chamber i took an another reading if there is a variation in this chamber then it has a direct directional dependency so that this chamber should not have any kind of a directional dependency and minimum stem leakage as we talk about stem leakage there should be a minimum stem leakage all these chambers when we try to use in a larger field the stem leakage has to be minimal like for an example if you take a formal chamber it has a very minimal stem leakage and chamber should be calibrated for exposure against the standard instrument always all the chamber when you use in a clinical 
like you know this pharma chamber everything has to be calibrated against the primary chamber and the primary standard will give an calibration factor that has to be multiplied with your meter reading to get an your exposure or observed dose there should be minimal or no ion recapitulation uh, inside your air cavity that will see in our subsequent slides okay all these chambers are connected to an electrometer okay so that an operational amplifier is a very important component which amplifies your signal normally the because when you try to measure the ionization produced in this chambers normally we get an you know current of some, something about 10 power minus 4 or 10 power minus 15 ampere so that you know we need to clearly we have to amplify otherwise you know it will be very difficult to you know what kind of an ionization happen in the ionization we need to amplify it. so that all these electrometer have an amplification which is using an operational amplifier so that all this operational amplifier has a high open loop gain which is somewhere around 10 power 4 and an input impedance of 10 power 12 ohms for an example if you have an ionization current of 10 power minus 8 ampere the it has an inbuilt resistance of 10 power 9 so that the output voltage is somewhere around 10 volts which is good enough to measure <coughs> any any you know any amount of ionization so that operational amplifier exactly used to amplify the amount of an ionization produced in your ion chamber because it's very small which is in the range of you know like you know uh, nano coulombs or pica coulombs or hecta coulombs so that we need to amplify this so that this operational amplifiers are helpful to amplify the amount of ionization produced in the ionization chambers and amplify it and we can you know get a reading in your electrometers okay so that in electrometers we have normally three different modes one is we have an integrated mode normally like we know the when you connect this chambers like in the operational amplifier and you have an capacitance like you know feed it into the loop normally what what happen is the voltage across the capacitance which is from the chamber and the uh, by the voltmeter and the given by the q by c where c is the capacity of this capacitance so that the measurement of the voltage is essential for measuring the ionization charge so that the integrated modes are used to accumulate the dose for a particular time for an example i want to measure on a 200 mu in a lenac in a integrated mode i can just put an in a integrated mode all these charges will be accumulated in the capacitance and once just i stop the integrated mode i'll get a reading so that for a 200 mu monte units in a lenac <coughs> of, or in a 2 minutes in a cobalt unit i get a reading in a integrated mode the second <coughs> mode is something called rate mode normally instead of a capacitance we put an resistance there so that the irritation of a chamber causes like a changing of the variation current so that rate mode is normally help us to understand what is the change in the uh, like you know dose rate normally if i kept a 400 dose rate in my lenac now i put a uh, like you know chamber within a dose rate mode so, so that you know i can constantly get an 400 like you know centigrade per minute dose rate so that the rate modes are especially try to you know measure the rate of the out, rate of the you know um, any exposure the other uh, the final mode is a direct exposure method where you have a capacitance as well as resistance is connected so that the total capacitance or resistance feedback circuit once the closed loop gain of the operational amplifier is unity the output voltage is given by the voltage across the feedback and the element so that this for using this we can measure what is the ronjon per minute instantly using the direct exposure method reading okay during the ion collection there is an um, some concept The, there is a loss of ionization because of the recombination effect what is the recombination effect is whenever a radiation is entering and you have an ionization is taking place because of a photovoltaic effect or an compton effect whatever the process is we have an ions okay but you have a positive ions as well as a negative ions if you don't give a sufficient voltage these ions will recombine okay that is called a recombination if you miss some of the electrons and the like you know like you know uh, ne- positive ions which like you know come into each other we lost the ionization so that our our measurement is not going to be accurate so that the recombination like you know if if you can see in this table if you apply a voltage if it is in the beginning it is very linear and after that it gets saturated the ion current is here so that during this region <coughs> we lose a lot of ions has been recombination because we do, we have not given enough voltage between the electrodes <coughs> so that this is an um, uh, typical gas field characteristics of an ion chamber we need to clearly understand this so that if you see when you try to give an voltage between these two electrodes the central electrode and outer electrode we try to give something about 150 kv so that this is in 100 200 300 400 so that if we can see this ionization recombination region 
So the iron collection efficiency is not really good here. You can see here, there are a lot of loss of ions because of the recombination, because we are not giving sufficient voltage between the outer electrode and the inner electrode so that the ions are getting recombined and we are missing the ionization. Normally the ionization region is the region where we use all these chambers for our measuring purpose. Normally it ranges from 150 to 350 to 400 range volt. All these ionization chambers will measure operated under this particular voltage. Once you increase this voltage, what will happen is this is a very, like, you know, we can see this is very straight so that, you know, there is not much loss of a recombination so that the recombination is totally neglected in this region. So that if you are able to apply something about 200 to 400 volt, we are able to minimize the recombination completely. So that all the sinus chamber will work in this region. And we have some method to re, like, you know, subtract this recombination effect. Once you increase this higher voltage within this chamber, what will happen is there will be a multiplic the multiplication of these ions. And once it goes into the Geiger-Muller counter region, there will be a gas amplification happens. And more than that, we'll have a continuous arcing happens. So that normally we, with using this ionization chambers, we are morally interested in the ionization region. So that ion recombination and saturation, if you can see this curve, it's totally flat here between the 150 and 350 volt. So the charge collected by the electrode in the ionization chamber will be less than the charge produced in the ionization recombination region due to the insufficient voltage applied between the electrode. So that if you try to measure anything between the applied voltage between something about zero to 150 volt, there's a lot of chances we are able to miss the ionization uh, collection of the ions because they are there because we don't have a sufficient voltage between this applied voltage between these two electrodes and we may sufficiently miss the number of ions collected there. So that ionization, which is something about 150 to 300 kV, which has a saturated region where the ion recombination is totally nil. The ion, re the ion recombination can be, like, can be decreased by increasing the applied voltage. So that higher the voltage will result in the gas amplification so that you know we cannot use more than 400 kV in the ionization chamber. So otherwise you'll have a further multiplication and it'll be the increase in the ion collection. So that, uh, this is a uh, graph which gives an amount of an ion recombination correction from AAPM TG21 protocol. So that if you can see a continuous radiation, continuous radiation is nothing but you know your cobalt uh, or an, any any gamma emitter like cobalt or an cesium, and pulse radiation is uh, like your X-rays or an electrons, and pulse scanning is like protons. So that if you if you see uh, if the meter reading between you know uh, the 150 and 200 volt, if you can read, meter reading is between 1.02. Your correction factor for the correction is something about less than 5% here, okay? But if the beta readings between the two values of the ion recombination, like, you know, if, if I keep one voltage of 300 and one voltage of 150, then if the values changes more than like 10%, obviously you need to correct for more for the ion recombination correction. Normally it doesn't happen like with the farmer chamber, the ion recombination is obviously less than 0.5%. And this is an example value, like, you know, we calculated for a 6 mm beam, the, for the former chamber, the ion recombination is just, just it's only 0.3%. Okay, next we'll get into the polarity effect. Normally, like, you know, the polarity effect is something about when you try to give an voltage, the inner electrode has a positive voltage and outer electrode a negative voltage. And you take a reading for something about in a LINAC for 200 mm. And you just reverse the voltage to negative and the positive, and you take a reading, that's a small change in the difference because of the polarity effect. So that the main uh, two reasons for the polarity effect is, once the high energy electron such as Compton electron ejected from the central electrode by high energy photons constitute a current. Okay, this current or normally we used to call external current or the current because of your inner electrode which is a material. So that this Compton current which is independent of your cavity and which added your polarity effect. So that this Compton current is going to give a more current and which added current and which gives a change in the polarity. So that this may add and reduce the collector current depends upon the polarity which you apply to the electrode. And it affects the minimize by making the collecting electrode very thin. So that you know, if you, if you see the farmer chamber, the central electrode is just only one millimeter. So that as thin you make it, the polarity effect will be reduced. For the parallel plate chamber, it has a more effect due to the less electrode spacing. So that when you try to measure uh, like um, electron beams using a parallel plate, as the electron energy decreases, you'll have a more polarity effect um, compared to a higher energies. And other important factor is external current where, you know, you have an external current from outside the chamber cavity, 
which also additions this like you know added the polarity effect so the polarity effect can be easily corrected when you take a reading with a positive polarity and you add with a negative polarity and divide with the polarity which is calibrated in the standard lab we can correct this polarity uh, like you know correction for the polarity normally this polarity correction for photon beam is normally less than 0.5% whereas in electron beam it can go up to 1 to 2% and normally this effect increases with the decrease in the electron energy and it's important to determine the polarity effect for the electron beam and we need to find in the different depths it varies the next thing like you know the important correction factors is about the effect of pressure in ion collection okay like if you see uh, like you know it's a small animation here if you see if the same amount of a volume here okay if the pressure is normal here when you apply a pressure you can see the amount of an uh, molecules inside the like a high pressure area is going to increase so that when when the pressure is increased the ion collection is going to increase because the number of molecule has been increased so that it when you have a pressure is low the ion collection is going to decrease so that ion collection is directly proportional to the pressure again the temperature like you know when you increase the temperature you can see the the molecules are loosely packed so that if the temperature increases the collection of the ion is going to decrease so that ion collection is inversely proportional to the temperature so that the temperature pressure always need to be corrected like you know the temperature pressure like the need to be corrected like you know it can be done with an um, uh, like milligram of uh, mercury m of mercury or it can be in kilopascal pressure can be mentioned in both the equation this is the equation to correct for temperature pressure for the ion collection <coughs> if for an example if the pressure is uh, like you know it's a standard lab pressure is 101.33 and the temperature is 22 our correction factor is just only one okay but normally it doesn't happen like if i change the pressure to uh, temperature to 25 degrees celsius you can see there is a 1% of a difference in the collection efficiency i had to correct around 1% if i change the pressure something about instead of 101 instead of 104 you can see there is more than 2.5% of change in the ionization because of the change in the volume of the so the temperature pressure have a great impact in the ion collection so that when, whenever you like you know if you go for an you know any dosimetry equipments don't you know try to compromise to buy a quality thermometer and a barometer a temperature pressure uh, like if you don't measure it properly the absolute dose what you measure in your clinic in the linac or a cobalt machine which can vary between 3 to 4% so that a calibrated thermometer and a barometer which is traceable to a primary lab is very important to have an accurate dose measurement so that uh, like to finally to want to measure an exposure what are the parameters we need to know so that this is an exposure i want to measure so that this is a meter reading which is given by the my electrometer connected to the chamber and nx is the uh, calibration factor which is given by the primary standard lab calibrated to my chamber so that the nx is be nx is be the calibration factor and ptp is the pressure temperature correction what we have done and uh, p ion is the recombination correction what we have done and psd is the uh, like you know saturation correction what we have done so that we need all these parameters correction when you try to go for a measurement for an exposure so that uh, like uh, this is a reference like you know i used uh, and i uh, for the fm con i took the fifth edition and uh, then i just i try to do some slide share from some of the presentations and uh, thank you thanks uh, thanks again for your patience thank you thank you dr karthik for the excellent presentation it was a bit difficult chapter for us for radiation oncologists maybe not for the medical physicists that much but for radiation oncologists it was a bit difficult to understand and it made it very simple thank you very much and i think we have few questions in q and a section and uh, dr jibak i request you to take those questions okay uh, so uh, the first question is that uh, sir what is uh, the component of guard electrode in pharma type of chamber okay <clears throat> see the guard electrode in the pharma type chamber is just you know it is encapsulated against the central electrode so that it will just try to avoid your uh, you know change in the polarity correction as well as it will try to reduce your stem effect you know stem leakage it also guarded towards your 
uh, towards the you know central electrode which is connected to the through the cables which has been entirely covered with the guard electrode just to, to, to avoid the amount of an you know ionization which is taking place out of your cavity volume which is your active volume to to reduce the amount of ionization which is produced outside this cavity volume we can this guard electrode will you know guard the amount of ionization there so that you know the main purpose is just to guard the central electrode as well as to avoid the amount of ionization produce the active volume to this guard electrode will act as a guard okay uh the next question is uh, please repeat the concept of cylinder perturbation okay you want uh, perturbation okay so that you know what what was i was talking about the perturbation is like you know when you try to use a cylindrical chamber uh, the problem is like when you try to do a measurement in the air like you know the thickness of the material wall material has to be uh, like you know normally the perturbation correction has to be an included in your calibration factor itself okay but most of the times if you if you are measuring a surface dose uh, using this cylindrical chamber what is happening is your the the wall, the cylindrical wall or if you are doing any measurements in the air yeah, the amount of a thickness in your chambers or normally it's like you know it's equal to your air yeah, as we discuss about the effective atomic number so that we need to use an cap or something about if you want to use a cobalt mean like you know a cylindrical chamber in the inner measurement we use a 5 mm cap to make just you know make sure you know we are uh, getting in an electronic equilibrium so that this caps are used or the build up materials around the chambers are used to avoid this kind of an perturbation and help us to make the electronic equilibrium in the inner measurements okay that is the main reason like you know why we avoid a perturbation of this wall and the main issue is like you know we can increase the electronic equilibrium for the chambers that is very important to define your measurement okay uh, uh, the next question is uh, that Uh, nucleus does not contain electron how more than 1.02 mep energy of photons by interaction with nucleus create electron positron pair okay so th- okay see uh, see like you know that's that's uh, that's what i uh, know it's an uh, it's a beauty of uh, physics okay uh, i already told you like you know it is an typical example of an energy is been uh, it's not about the nucleus is uh, you know giving an electron and a photon okay it's about a photon is being converted to a particle okay there is nothing happening into your nucleus with the force of a nucleus when a photon of an energy of 1.02 mev interacting with the nuclear field and photon energy has been converted into a particle no nothing has been happened to your nucleus there is an influence of a nuclear field, the nucleus there but the energy of the photon has been converted to an electron and a positron it there is uh, the electron is not coming from the nucleus it is has been the photon energy has been converted to an particle so uh, the next question is uh, from dr bosundara chand uh, she is saying sir please explain regions other than uh, ionizing radiation in the graph okay okay probably you know when when you get into the radiation safety uh, like you know chapter probably you know they will uh, explain you much better rich but still i will try to explain okay this is nothing but okay in the x axis we are, like you know we have an applied voltage in y axis is the number of an ion collector okay so that what is happening is when you try to don't give an enough voltage like this is called an ion recombination region so that if you don't give enough applied voltage between an inner electrode and an outer electrode what happen is there is a lot of chances of ion recombination so that this region between an applied voltage between 0 to 150 we used to call ion recombination region okay so that there are a lot of recombination effect is happening because we are not giving sufficient applied voltage between these two electrodes the second thing is ionization region this is the region how we measure our clinical dose measurements normally we apply somewhere between 200 to 400 volt that is called the ionization region in proportional regions normally we describe the alpha we can you know differentiate between an alpha and beta particle there and proportional region there is a gas amplification happens 
one not only the ionization produced in the mass okay what happens because you applied a more voltage because of this electrons which is going to collide with an other molecules this elect the ionization getting doubled or multiplied in the proportional region if you further amplify it like what will happen we will have a gas amplification so that when you have like you know these are uh, like you know really helpful for the survey meters when you want to try to measure a condomination okay i am getting a very small signal but i need to amplify it okay so that if you see use a geiger muller counter if i have a very small amount of radiation you but i am operating as a higher voltage i get all this very less signal get amplified to an something about 10 power 10 times of you know collection ions and we can use it for an you know like you know radiation survey meters and once you cross more than 1000 100 like you know volt between these two electrodes like you know there will be an arcing happen really it is not clinically useful okay normally we use uh, the ionization range for ionization chambers and proportional region for proportional counters and gm region for geiger muller counters okay so uh, dr shobhana is asking if you can explain the concept of polarity once again okay okay what is polarity effect is uh, mainly when, when when you try to give an in like you know this is a central electrode i am giving a positive potential and for an outer electrode i give a negative potential i given a 200 mu and i took a reading i got 10 nanopole okay then i change my potential the inner electrode is negative and outer electrode is positive i given a same 200 mu but i instead of a 10 nanopole i got 10.5 nanopole okay why there is a change is because the main reason of this uh, polarity effect is the compton current produced by the electrode because the electrode which is in the center of the former chamber which is made up of aluminum okay so that the ionization produced the x ray interacted with all this aluminum produce an extra ionization because of the material is high density material and this added your more ionization because we are trying to collect all the ions here but there is an extra ion produced because of the interaction between this aluminum material and as well as the x rays so that you know we'll have a more ionization produced because then if you can change this polarity we can correct for that and sometimes you know we uh, if if we, we also get an extramural current you know some outside your chamber cavity so that by changing the polarity we can correct for this uh, polarity effect okay so that the polarity effect is mainly uh, like because of uh, the compton current produced by the central electrode okay. as well as the extramural currents uh, the next question is from uh, dr krishna uh, she is asking why has not volume and density featured in final exposure uh, formula presented in the last slide oh volume and temperature has been included in this formula is called ptp okay that is uh, temperature and pressure correction okay so that i you know the equation is uh, this is the ptp correction okay so that the temperature as pressure has been corrected in the ptp equation okay. uh, uh next question is uh, someone is asking uh, please repeat direct capacitive and resistive combination mode okay okay so that you know you, you know like you know the purpose of the capacitance is you know it charge and it discharge so that it really helps like you know when i try to measure for an integrated mode integrated mode is something about i try to measure for something about 60 seconds i want to integrate all the doses uh, i am measuring a cobalt unit for 1 minute so that 1 minute has 60 seconds i want to measure a doses for 60 seconds so that when i when i put the chamber and i put it in an integrated mode and for all the 60 seconds if i set the time 60 seconds the amount of an uh, dose will be totally charged in the capacitance and it will be def defined in the integrated mode so that i just integrated all my doses or all my exposure like you know in a particular integrated time for just something about you can say in a lenac it's something about 100 molecules or in a cobalt like uh, you are measuring uh, like for a minute so that integrated mode help us like you know they are connected to the capacitors because it accumulate all the charges and keep it and once like you know we stop it all the charge will be discharged and so that it will give an exact integrated like you know what are the charges collected for the entire course of the time for like you know one minute when you go to the rate mode 
like here, like you know, it it just continuously gives out the output. So that if I, I'm putting in a 400 mu per minute in a Linux, just I'm putting in a rate mode, I'm continuously getting a reading reading of something about okay, I'm getting a 400 uh, like you know uh, 10 nanocoulomb continuously like you know it's in a rate mode. So that you know I can measure in voltage there, like you know it shows so that I can measure okay what is the dose rate there. So the rate mode is help us to measure the dose rate, and uh, integrated mode is measure the to accumulate the doses to a course of a time. Uh, so we have a question from YouTube also. Um, uh, Mr. Pramod Kumar Yadav, he's asking, how can I know that our thermometer and pressure is calibrated? Okay. Normally, uh, when you buy a uh, thermometer and um, barometers, see, like, you know, there, uh, these are, uh, I have a personal experience, you know, like I bought in a local shop, like, you know, where you get a thermometer and a thermometer is something about for 100 rupees. And I bought, like, you know, it's my personal experience. I bought a three thermometers and I tried to measure all the three in my, you know, those, during my dosimetry measurements, all the three has a difference of something about one degree, two degree, and all the three thermometers are giving three different values. Okay, so that don't believe in this, you know, local thermometers always because temperature pressure correction is going to create an error of something about three to four percent if you don't accurately correct for it. So that you buy a thermometer, which, always they provide a calibration certificate along with that, which is traceable to a primary standard. So that you buy a thermometer, normally we have a thermometer in our, like in our center, which we bought it for around something about $2,000, okay? And we, we are using it for last 10 years. Like, you know, we, we always, the measurements are having an accuracy of like, my, term, my thermometer has an accuracy of 0 0.01 degrees Celsius. And it's very accurate and it has a traceability certificate. So that be sure, like, you know, don't buy a local items, you know, try to, buy a good thing like which can have an very accurate and which has a traceability whenever you buy always buy with an calibration certificate okay uh, the next question is that um, how can we differentiate thimble chamber and pharma chamber okay And also, uh, there is one more question related to it that uh, in thimble chamber, what is the active volume? Is shale wall air also included in the active volume along with the cavity? Okay. So, that, okay, thimble chamber, the main difference between the thimble chamber and the pharma chamber is in the thimble chamber only we have two electrodes, okay? One is the central electrode and the wall, which is having a conductive material, and the wall is being given to another other electrode. So, that we have only one air central electrode and the thimble chamber like uh, the wall has been the wall which is have and coated like you know normally it has a carbon coated which is uh, coated with a conductive material so that the wall has been act as an like an, another uh, electrode whereas in the formatate chamber we have three electrodes as we mentioned we have a central electrode as well as an outer electrode as well as a guard electrode so that the pharma chambers are a standard of uh, like you know when you go for an absolute dosimetry pharma type chambers are highly recommended Thimble type chambers are really, you know, useful for an, you know, uh, like we, when, when you try to use an, like you want to find an exposure for an X-ray tubes, we can use a thimble chamber. But normally when you want to do an absolute dose measurements, pharma chambers are really recommended. And the main difference is like, you know, the thimble chambers having only two, ele two electrodes, one is an outer electrode and an inner electrode, whereas pharma types have three electrodes and they are very versatile and they have a very less uh, like, you know, uh, stem effect compared to the thimble chamber. Okay, so one more question is that uh, please give overview of ion chambers in clinical use in Linux. It is related, that's why I am asking it. Okay, uh, in Clinac. In uh, you, you are, okay, so normally as you see when when you do an absolute dose calibration, we always try to use uh, ionization chambers like former type chambers are recommended to do absolute dosimetric calibration for the clinic. Normally when you try to uh, like, you know, tune the machine one centigrade per one MU at the D max, like uh, normally we used to do with the palmatite chamber. Okay. But there is an ionization chamber, the MU chamber, which is in the uh, like, you know, uh, linear oscillators. Like, you know, there is a difference between these two chambers. Okay. The MU chambers in the clinic are sealed chambers because I already told you during, due to the change in the temperature pressure, the ion collection can vary to three to 4%. If I, uh, in the MV chambers, like in the linear oscillators, if they are open to the environment, they are sealed chambers, the pressure inside the chambers, MU chambers are maintained. So that the temperature and the pressure inside the MU chambers are maintained so that it is not going to change with the environmental condition. Whereas in our chamber, 
like the temperature pressure is going to change the ion collection and we need to correct for it whereas in the me chambers in the linear oscillators they are not open to the environment they maintain the temperature as well as the pressure there so that the ion collection is not going to change there okay that's the main difference between a sealed chamber and an unsealed chamber this chambers what we talk about formal chambers and the simple chambers these are open to the environment so that whatever the corrections we required in the air like you know what is the temperature and the pressure here we correct for it whereas in the mu chambers in the linear oscillators these are sealed chambers okay uh, the next question is um, please repeat the demerits of uh, free air ionization chamber okay Okay, the main drawback is you know this free air ionization cannot be used in clinically because these are will be these are very expensive equipments and it it can be mostly in the primary standard lab like you know in our uh, BRC we they'll have a primary standard lab like you know they have a secondary standard lab or in the primary standard lab like you know IAA Vienna or uh, like you know for the dosimetry uh, like you know uh, uh, like a primary dosimetry lab secondary dosimetry lab they have these kind of a chambers they, these are not meant for clinical use these are uh, the main uh, use of the free air ionization chambers or just to calibrate your former chamber or a, like you know your simple chambers you can calibrate and they will give a calibration factor and the problem with this uh, like you know a free air ionization chamber is we cannot use it for a higher energy range more than 3 mav because if you want to use the more than 3 mav the electrode separation has to be increased so that we need to have a very big like you know if i want to use a 6 mev um, like you know 6 mev i want to measure with an free air ionization chamber i have to have something about uh, like uh, something about 4 or 5 meters big free air ionization chamber and the and once you increase the room width the polarity between these two collecting electrodes is not going to be uniform so that the ion recombination can take place in between so that it is not going to be accurate so that the free air ion chamber the main drawback is we cannot measure our exposure with this free air ion chamber more than 3 mav and it can be only work less than 3 mav we can use it for um, measurement of exposure we cannot move use more than that and it can give only exposure you know we cannot measure up the dose with the free air ion chamber why can exposure be measured only for x-ray and gamma rays and not for other type of radiation okay that's a good question normally when we talk about uh, exposure like you know exposure normally the definition of exposure is only meant for x-rays and gamma rays and in the air it's not in the medium and it's not meant for um, like you know beta and uh, like you know alpha particles normally like you know we go into the you know units called um, sievert like you know the other units like you know observed dose like you know you can measure in gray but not in the unit of exposure okay and there are other calibration factors like you know when you go to the kerma like you know this is an you know this is the first when we like you know when we start with the dosimetry the exposure is the first unit after that if you see observed dose to uh, water calibration and observed dose to kerma calibration where we can use that for electron measurements or alpha particle measurements but and as an exposure like you know the primary standard lab this x nx calibration cannot be used for other particles only the kerma calibration factors which can be used for to measure the doses for electrons and other particles not for uh, like electrons and uh, one more question is that uh, both gamma and beta particles emit from source together how we measure exposure by different chamber I mean, if both gamma and beta particles is emitted from the source together. Okay, so say for example, if you take a cobalt, okay, then we have an encapsulation in the cobalt source itself. Most of the electron which is produced by the uh, cobalt source has been, you know, uh, like, you know, uh, filtered by this, like, you know, like this capsule itself. We don't have uh, the electrons, you know, uh, come through this, but so, so that, you know, normally we are measuring, uh, the exposure has been defined only a pure, gamma emitter or a pure x-ray yeah, this uh, electron particles are not included when during the exposure measurements okay and the last question is that uh, dr boshundara is asking again that uh, sir you said exposure it is measured in air only so are these linac ion chambers accurate oh so see like you know now the dosimetry concept has changed now we are like you're, you're talking about the emu chamber in the uh, machine or you're talking about the chamber measurement with the phantom i think uh, 
I think she is asking about. Uh, I mean, uh, in the Phantom. Okay. See, in the Phantom. See, nowadays, nowhere we are measuring any inner measurement. This is a very old concept. Okay. So the probably you know the next chapter is absorbed absorbed dose. We can clearly understand exposure is uh, is just so it's just for inner measurements only. Okay. When you go for absolute dosimetric calibration purpose, we always use in water measurements. We never used to all the inner measurement have a lot of uncertainties. in measuring doses so that we we are never use any kind of an you know exposure measurement and convert to a dose now we have a calibration factor called nd ndw calibration factor which has been given an inside water calibration factor we don't use in air measurement for any kind of an uh, like in, if it's a brachytherapy or it's an you know external beam or it's a like a linear oscillator or it's a cobalt in air measurement has been totally stopped we are not using for measurement okay the we always use a phantom like you know in phantom measurements because like phantom measurements have a more higher and higher accuracy than an inner measurement yeah, and one question from youtube also uh, that uh, what ion chamber was uh, used in old days where when ortho voltage machines were used and the same time she is also uh, she or he is also asking that um, what kind of ion chamber is used for kb machines 100 kb machine okay so that you know the simple chambers are there you know normally uh, has been uh, used uh, uh, during the ortho voltage um, uh, method probably the farmer chamber has been introduced in 1950s i believe like uh, the farmer chambers are somewhere around 1940s or 1950s before that you know the simple chambers are used for the, all these extreme measurements ortho voltage measurements i think in 1950s after 1950 only the farmer chamber has been started using it Okay. And the last question is: How is electrometer? Uh, how is electrometer dose converted to MUs? Okay. Normally, we don't convert electrometer dose to MUs. Electrometer can give you a uh, dose per two hundred molar units or dose per minute. So that we divide the dose by number of molar units, so you will get a dose per MU. Okay. so uh, uh, this is the last question i am going to ask uh, uh, after this we are not going to take any more questions so this is uh, by dr shobhana uh, she is asking if uh, beta particles are absorbed by the capsule when we say recombination of ions what do we mean uh, photons recombine with what no no uh, what i mean is the capsule is uh, the source capsule itself absorbed all these electrons i don't think you know when you go and measure the cobalt unit cobalt rays in a cobalt unit you have an electron contamination there because the source capsule it's have a some kind of a shielding to absorb all these electrons okay so that you know the source capsule itself itself like you know there is an electron emitting from the cobalt decay which has been absorbed by the source capsule itself which has a shielding material there to absorb these electrons normally we don't have it, like you know the electron contamination will be less than 0.1% in the gamma radiation which comes from the cobalt unit so the recombination is uh, from the recombination. from the outside Hey, no, no. The recombination, the recombination effect is happening because if you are not able, to, it's inside the cavity of the volume, not from the anywhere else. Okay, like you know, we are talking about the volume. Okay, I have a central electrode, I have an outer electrode. If I don't give enough voltage between the central electrode and an outer electrode, the ions produced there because there are multiple ions are produced there. Okay, if you don't give sufficient voltage, they will recombine there inside the air cavity. our intention is to collect all the ions in the air cavity not anywhere else okay the chamber cavity is more important yes so that the recombination effect what we are talking is inside the chamber cavity no nowhere else okay okay thank you thank you very much it was a great session Sh uh, shand over to you yeah thank you thank you dr karthik yeah i know thank it was you. a little bit uh, difficult you know like some some of the areas yes. like you know uh, like you know i i know i apologize i cannot make it more simple than than this uh, sure, sure but, i can understand <laughs> i yes. hope you know i hope that the main intention is you know the, we, we, there are some correction factors required and we need to know understand like you know chambers like you know why we use chambers see but uh, because this unit you know don't uh, i there are a lot of misconception about uh, this unit you know i want to just clear few things Let's see the exposure is a very old unit nowadays we don't use it okay unless until we use it only for the survey survey of the radiation bunkers we use okay we use milli rongen per hour or something nowhere else we use this unit for uh, like you know the dosimetry of a patient or an linac dosimetry or something so that you need to have a clear idea 
this this component has been you know this rongen is having a lot of uncertainties and this component is not no more used in uh, like you know patient clinical dosimetry it has been still it has been used only in radiation safety point of view like you know i have a source pill or a source pillage in a nuclear medicine i want to check like you know i want to just what is an activity there i want to just what is a dose like you know coming out from a nuclear medicine spillage or if a source is struck you know i want to check mainly this rongen has been used only for uh, some purpose for the radiation safety point of view okay it is at this point of time normally we talk about observed dose in gray okay all these units like you know like sievert milli sievert like you know equivalent dose so that rongen is a very old unit but we need to understand this so that you know we can understand this new units gray and milli sievert very clearly so the don't try to you know uh, get too much into this uh, exposure like you know exposure is not a very common unit nowadays we follow but we need to have a clear understanding of what is exposure uh yeah dr sain okay thank you thank you dr karthik yeah. so we'll meet you in the next class your next scheduled class so yeah. thank you very much again yeah thank you thank you thanks a lot and and a very good night thank you good night